Hey there, Duke fans. Welcome to episode 219 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. A two for this week, second one of the week, because we wanted to tell you about a special interview we did just a couple days ago with none other than Jack White, the newest professional Dukey Blue Devil, um, not in the NBA, in the NBL, the Australian Basketball League. But before we get to that, introductions are in order, as always. I'm your host this week, or at least for this episode, my name is Jason Evans, coming to you from Atlanta, where, as we discussed last episode, it is hot and steamy. Um, Donald Wine joining me from D.C. How's it going there, Donald? Has the weather gotten okay. any better? No, the weather hasn't gotten any better. I, I don't care about the weather. The weather sucks. I need to hijack this for a second, because as we record at 1 p.m. Uh, on the East Coast on Thursday, July 23rd, just under an hour ago, the newest NHL team name was announced and it is easily one of the top five names in the world of sports the seattle kraken i'm not even a seattle fan but that name is fantastic Uh, whoever came up with that whoever rode with that take a bow because release the kraken is going to be the biggest slogan in the nhl next year I I have no problem at all with you being excited about a team being called the Kraken. Uh, I just, I just hope that there, there, we already have a Titans. We we need like the Poseidon or something like that, or, or, or the Pegasus or something. We're on our way. We're we're on our way. Maybe the Seattle basketball team, if it's not the Sonics for some reason, if they ever come back, maybe they go Poseidon or something else related to that. But the Kraken just, Absolutely nailed it. And the logo, if, if, if you haven't looked on, on Twitter or social media, the logos that they came out with are also fantastic. They, they literally nailed every aspect of this. Sam Klein, join us from uh, up north. Sam, what you're feeling about the Kraken? So I wanted to start today by talking about how great it is that I get to watch the Nationals on TV tonight on ESPN playing the Yankees with Max Scherzer on the mound. Happy but- opening day. Happy opening day. I even got my my new Washington Nationals mask on. But Donald, I'm with you. I'm so excited about the about a new team totally nailing their intro with the Seattle Kraken. I did open some Twitter commentary where people were saying that the name is not cool. Those people are wrong because the the logo, the intro video, the alternate logo that has the space needle in it, all of them are awesome. It and what I really love is that they kept with the rest of the Seattle team's adherence to, one, the general color scheme of, like, marine-type colors, and two, the general marine team names, right? So Seattle's already got the Mariners and the Seahawks, Sounders the and the Seahawks and yeah. Storm. All of these are, are, are weather, you know, marine-related names, and they kept that – uh, here with the Kraken. So I think it's awesome. I love that that they're all related to each other. I love that, you know, if you're a Seattle fan, you can go to the games with the, with, with you know, paraphernalia from the other teams and they notionally then support each other through their color scheme. So I think it's awesome. On the flip side, could you be less inspiring than the ongoing <laughs> disaster in our nation's capital, which is the Washington football team who have announced that they are this season going by the Washington football team as their name. I don't know. No football team. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Donald, I, I I know that there was a lot of chatter this week about Charlotte FC going with Charlotte FC, which is mm-hmm. pretty lame. But man, Washington football team this is, is bad. Look, I, I wasn't going to talk about Charlotte. Like, I thought that name, they had a bunch of what I thought would be great soccer names. And I think they missed it with Charlotte FC. I think the logo, the crest is great. Uh, but I did not like that they went with that name after all the other options they had, but somehow, some way, the Washington football team decided, hold up, we got this. We, we got the we, terrible name. We, were, we <laughs> will be worse. We will be worse. Than, and it literally came out at the same time as the Kraken was released. And so when you see that two, the two things on Twitter, it was only like, Washington, like you, you waited three weeks to tell us that we've been what? using that for years. Like what a <laughs> giant, what a giant L. <laughs> football team took this week and all they do all they do normally is take l's but man this one is is bad and, and, and as you it, said Donald, particularly in contrast to the awesome name that seattle just got and the last thing on, on washington before we actually get into actual 
you know, what oh, we yeah, we're, to talk about. We're, we're, we're going to talk about Duke basketball. <laughs> yeah, but, but the last thing on the Washington football team is this is – they said immediately they're going by it, but it's going to take 50 days to change everything. That's the jerseys. That's the that's the signage around the stadium, everything online. They have to rename their entire training facility. Like all of that apparently is going to take a lot of time. So they still had all this time to think about it, and they haven't even started doing that yet. So that just – yeah, it's fine. That's all I, I want to know. Will, will will they be Washington FT? Like you know, like we have the FCs. Will they be Washington FT? Because that's just easier to say than football team. It takes less well, time. I'm, I'm, I, I did see one funny comment that says it would have would have been really good if they were the Washington team football because then they mm-hmm. could be the WTF, which would have really <laughs> which really nailed it. That would have nailed really would have nailed the whole organization <laughs> top to bottom. <laughs> The, the last thing I'll say about all of this is that I hope the naming of the team as the Kraken will have people, will encourage people. This is the film critic coming out now. Go watch the 1981 Clash of the Titans, the 1981 film with Harry Hamlin that is incredibly cheesy. It's got Burgess Meredith. I mean, it is, it's bad in every bad way that makes a film great. Don't bother to watch the 2010 remake, which is just bad. It's not bad but, in a good way. But it has the slogan that everyone knows. It has the release, the Kraken, in the 2010 version as well. And that's the one with, with uh, yeah. Liam Neeson that everyone remembers. Yeah, they only remember it because it's more recent. I'm telling you, the 1981 version is a better film than the 2010 version. It has terrible stop-motion animation in it. It's got this little mechanical owl that is like the greatest bad character you've ever seen. Watch the 1981 version. The 2010 version is lousy. But Just Liam watch Neeson the clip of 2010. Just watch the release. Yeah. Okay. Clip. Yeah. I know I'm going to, I know I'm going to spoil a, a very small amount of game of Thrones here, but if Theon Greyjoy had ended up on the iron throne at the end of game of Thrones, they really could have gone hard with house Greyjoy on, on the Kraken. But I digress. Can we talk about Duke? Yeah, let's do that. I think that would make some sense. Uh, We're going to talk specifically um, about Jack White. Uh, A couple days ago, Duke arranged for several members of the media to get a chance to speak to Jack White just shortly after Jack had announced that he'd be returning to Australia to play for Melbourne United, uh, Jack becoming a professional basketball player um, in, in the way I think that we all sort of expected the NBA not yet in the cards for him, maybe somewhere down the line. But whether that happens or not, he's going to be a pro in, in Australia. He'd had multiple teams bidding on him, talking to him, and he signed with Melbourne United, one of the better teams in the NBL. Um, so uh, uh, this isn't technically the same kind of interview we sometimes have here on the Duke Basketball Report podcast where we get to go one-on-one. Um, I was one of about 20 different reporters who were on this call, but because I'm pushy and aggressive and, and a pain in the neck, I got to ask a whole bunch of questions of Jack while a lot of the other reporters just sat around and listened to me asking the questions. Sat around, I say, we, it, this was a Zoom call, so sitting around in our own socially distant way. So I, I do want you to hear from some of the other reporters, though, because they asked some good questions. So first up, we're going to have a question from Steve Wiseman of the Herald Sun and the News Observer, a great local reporter who covers Duke you know, probably better than anybody out there. He's ta- He wants to ask Jack a little bit about how Jack's dealing with Um, the virus, how Australia is dealing with the coronavirus. Um, Then you're going to get three questions from me. And then uh, last question you'll hear is from Mary Dunleavy of WRAL. um, And she's going to talk to Jack a little bit about his relationship with Coach K. But here is the interview, the conversation that a bunch of reporters had that I had with Jack White just a couple days ago about his decision to play pro basketball in Australia. Yeah, hey Jack. Um, what uh, what's the situation with with the virus there? As far as I, I read a little bit about in Australia that it was kind of getting tamped down, and now it's kind of maybe popping back up again. Do you guys plan on having games with fans? Uh, you testing a lot. Kind of what's your life like when it comes to that? Yeah, so uh, I mean, Australia was in a a pretty good spot. Um, you know, the the whole virus situation was pretty quiet, and you know, from the start when everything kind of started to ramp up. Um, Australia was pretty strict, strict from the beginning, and I guess that kind of helped us uh, maintain a low level of cases and um, and whatnot. But um, but yeah, now there's been a bit of a surge, you know, especially around Melbourne where I am right now. So cases have been kind of picking up a bit every day. You know, obviously not not to the level that the US, for example, is experiencing, but for what Australia had been uh, experiencing, you know, it's definitely on the rise. Um, so Melbourne, 
and like one of the surrounding areas is on a is on a lockdown right now where you can only go out for um like exercise essential work medical stuff and uh one other reason that's not coming to me right now but it's it's pretty strict and um actually as of thursday um if you go out without a mask then you can uh, get a 200 hundred dollar fine so they're really trying to be like pretty strict with um you know what they enforce to try and you know get this under control and obviously don't want to see it happen in other bigger cities like sydney and brisbane and really just trying to contain it um at the moment it's pretty serious but you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to, you know, go and work out three times a week with, with Melbourne and, um, you know, be able to get in a weight room. But I mean, other than those workouts, you know, I'm really just laying low in the uh, apartment right now. I'm staying with one of my buddies in the city. So I'm not driving back and forth between uh, the city and my hometown. I'd probably be the perfect person to spread it out into rural Victoria. So, you know, I'm trying to obviously avoid that. But yeah, right now for me, I'm very lucky that, you know, I can do I can train and do that because a lot of people don't have the opportunity to do that. But yeah, you know, I'm just trying to lay low and, and do the right thing. It's, it sucks obviously because life's obviously not as normal, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is. I, I could have a lot worse. Jack, thanks for chatting with us. Uh, I wanted to ask you, and this may seem a little strange because I know you probably want to talk about the team in Australia, but a, a few weeks back I saw um, lots of, uh, of social media posts of you being involved in, in some of the uh, Black Lives Matters protests um, around Durham. Can you right. talk to me about, about what motivated you to do that? I know that Nolan's been very involved and, and several of your other, um, you know, coaches sure. and teammates, Coach K, obviously. Talk about, you know, your perspective on it as well, especially as an Australian um, and looking at something that's happening that's very American, obviously. Yeah, well, I mean, it's something that I've definitely uh, – you know, learned about over my time in the US, especially, you know, my, my girlfriend's um, black, you know, my best friend Javin is black, you know, a lot of people that are very close to me are people of color um, and, you know, go through things that, you know, that, that I don't experience, you know, as, as an international uh, person in the US and just as a white person. Um, so, I mean, you know, just obviously seeing, you know, the events that transpired to, you know, kind of come to that point where there were protests and, and everything like that, you know, I really just try to educate myself and try to come to, you know, a better level of understanding so I could um, really just support my friends and people that I care about and in this time, you know, obviously, you know, when, when my friend and my girlfriend or, or Javin, for example, you know, saw what happened to George Floyd and he's getting killed and, you know, you just feel like that could have been anyone. You know, it's not it's not just him, you know, it could have been anyone. So, you know, I just kind of really felt like it was appropriate for me to stand in solidarity as as did a lot of um, people who weren't people of colour, you know, at those protests. So, I mean, you know, I just try to stand for the right thing and what I was raised to believe was right. And that's, you know, that that everyone should be equal and, you know, no one should, should feel unsafe or, you know, at a disadvantage compared to anyone else just because of something that they can't control. Um, so it was a big thing for me to, you know, kind of step up and, you know, understand that, you know, I have a platform and people look up to me and, you know, I have a pretty strong voice, um, I'd like to think. So, um, you know, for me to be there and um, especially as a white man um, to kind of stand up and acknowledge, you know, something, something's wrong and that as a, as a community, you know, we're trying to stand up against it. You know, I thought that was the right thing to do. So, Jack, I want to ask you about the unfortunate way that your senior season ended. Um, obviously, we now know there was no way, you know, to play games with, with the way the virus is coming on. But talk about what it was like, you know, maybe the 24, 48 hours where, you know, you guys hoped you were going to at least play an ACC tournament and then, then it all went away. And, and also the emotions, uh, you know, of playing for four years and then having it, having it end in an unceremonious kind of way. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a roller coaster. You know, we were in uh, Greensboro for, you know, about to start our, our pro season. And, uh, you know, the night before our first game was uh, was when they released the news about Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. And I remember there was kind of two hotel rooms where, you know, our team was split up and, you know, kind of half of us were in one room, half was in the other. And we were just on our phones, on Twitter, like checking stuff up, watching the TV is kind of everything on unfolded yeah it was scary um because you know obviously 
before that, we had gotten news that there was a case in uh, in Durham County and Wake County, sorry. And, um, you know, it all kind of started to seem a bit more real. And obviously we didn't know what that meant for us in terms of, you know, being able to play basketball and, and everything like that. So, I mean, a whole lot of uncertainty from our end. Um, us captains met with uh, with the coaches and, and coach the morning of our first game. Um, and we just told them that, we didn't feel like it was right. You know, the game was really the last thing on our minds. You know, we, we all had family um, in Greensboro and, you know, we're really just concerned about their health more than anything. And, you know, just trying to do the right thing as, as things were starting to escalate. But yeah, no, it was definitely a tough time. But I mean, in that moment, you know, it was, it was pretty emotional, you know, just because we felt like we had everything away from us. And I mean, I'm sure that I'm not going to be the only I haven't been the only guy that said this around the country, but, you know, I really thought that we had a, a good shot at not only winning that ACC tournament, but the NCAA tournament. Um, really thought we were hitting our stride at the right time. And, um, you know, I mentioned J-Rod, but, you know, everything just started to kind of click and come together for us. Um, so to kind of end on that note with, you know, kind of just that lasting thought of what could have been is probably the thing that kind of sticks with you the most. Um, but I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you know, obviously there's a pandemic going on. At the end of the day, you know, basketball can't come first in in that situation, and you know, the health and safety of of us and the people we care about, and um, you know, has to come first. So, you know, it took a bit to you know, kind of let that point of view um, kind of settle and begin to really resonate with us. But yeah, definitely, you know, obviously just an absurd situation that no one ever saw coming. So. Um, to have it you know just ripped away like that you know it's unfortunate but looking back on it now you know it's what had to be done. Jack I know that um, this summer has been different from past summers you haven't been able to hang out with your teammates nearly as much to to see how guys are progressing and, and becoming better but I, I wanted you to look ahead if you could um, you know at Jordan's senior year Joey is a junior Wendell and Matthew as sophomores talk about those returning guys that you know really well and what you think they will accomplish for this team next year, you know, speculate on, on who's going to be the guy to really step up and, and that kind of thing. Damn. I, I love all those guys. They're, they're my boys. Uh, but man, you know, honestly, I think all of them are about to step up in a big way. Um, you know, I've been in touch with all of them. They're all doing really well. And, you know, even got to work out with Joey a bit before I came back to uh, Australia, same with Wendell. Um, but man, I'm just excited for all of them. You know, we have a great freshman class coming in. Um, you know, come on, man. Are, hey, hey, man, come on. You got to give me a little more than they're all going to do really well. Come on. <laughs> well, man, that's really what I think. Um, I mean, Joey's been grinding. You know, I think Joey's goal is to be one of the best shooter in, in the conference, in the country. And I think, you know, he, he really has a good chance of doing that. You know, just knowing him, you know, he's a workhorse. He's, you know, we all know he's a great shooter. But I think, you know, along with that, I think he's really going to show people that he's expanded other parts of his game. He's spoken to me a lot about really trying to um, up his defense and be known as, as a tough defender, which, you know, is something that, you know, we spoke about even when we were together and we were trying to just kind of push each other in that um, regard to just heighten our level of, um, of play. Um, for Jay Gold, I mean, you know, we saw it last year, you know, coming into his own um, defensively, you know, he's a monster. I think, you know, we all know that, but, I know that he's really been working on his offensive game and, you know, his shooting. And, um, you know, I'm really excited for him to show more of a complete game on, on both ends. Um, even though we saw glimpses of that um, last year, you know, I think I'm really excited for him to show that it's going to be more of a consistent thing. And, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for the, the two freshman boys, Matt and Wendell, to come back after getting their first taste of, you know, college basketball and, I guess, come back with a hunger to kind of prove something getting to that point where the season got shut down and um you know that's going to stick with guys so i think they're they're just really excited to come back out and they feel like they have i mean all of them feel like they have unfinished business i guess and um you know they they just want to win i mean honestly yeah i'm just i'm really excited for all of them you know i really think they're just going to make big big strides in their own ways um and yeah i'm excited to tune in and you know i mean hopefully you know the season kind of runs as normal or best it can so we do have the opportunity to see those guys play but you know just super excited for all of them they got heaps heaps to show
Uh, Jack, the other day, Coach K called you the best teammate ever. How would you describe your time at Duke and the type of player you were? Um, well, I mean, first of all, that made me feel really good. Um, I'd probably have to disagree with him, actually, though. You know, I, I really think, you know, in my experience, J-Rob was one of the most selfless and, you know, he just cared about you a lot. You know, he was just super selfless and he just really wanted to see you do well. And, you know, i, I got to say, you know, I was just so happy. His stuff finished up, and March Madness would have would have seen a new a new player, you know, come into light with uh, with J Rob, I reckon. But um, you know, obviously, it was a huge honor for me to hear him say that, and um, you know, just to have him to be a uh, part of my career for for the four years, especially at the stage of his career that he's at, um, and you know, be able to be captain twice of his teams, and um, just learn from him on a daily basis, you know, was I feel like I'm one of the luckier basketball players on the planet in, in terms of uh, all that stuff. So just to have him, you know, on my side and um, just pushing me every day and just watching him push himself every day. Um, like he's not 72 years old and, you know, it's just incredible. Um, so, yeah, to hear, those, to hear him say that and say those nice words about me, um, yeah, it definitely made me feel good. So I want to thank Duke and thank Jack for arranging that for all of us uh, reporters. It was a, it was a lot of fun. It was interesting to to get a chance to to you know pick Jack's brain a little bit on a bunch of different topics. Donald, what what was your takeaway from it? What did you enjoy the most? Well, the part where you asked him about just the social justice movement and what he was participating in and, and his thoughts on it was pretty poignant to me, uh, mainly because of the fact that Jack White is Australian and Australia has had similar issues historically between white people and the indigenous populations of that continent. And so it's something that they still debate today, but they've done way more to kind of elevate and recognize the trials and tribulations of indigenous people in that country. And they've gone further than the United States to make amends for what they've done. So he's grown up in a society that he's had to deal with similar civil rights issues. And so I thought it was great for him to step up in another country, his, you know, we call it his adopted country, and call for change so that people near and dear to him can have the same opportunities and protections as everyone else. So I thought that was a very good uh, way to, you know, it was a great question that you asked. And, you know, I loved his answer. And just really that, if you know about that relationship that Australia has with its indigenous populations, that is, you know, that was a very great answer. Also, another comment that stood out to me was just his excitement about being close to home. He mentioned it had been six years that, you know, he had been away from home and hadn't really spent an extended period of time there and that, the you know, the virus allowed him to come home. And now he gets to do what very few people anywhere get to do, and that is start their pro career close to home. He's less, as he said, less than two hours away from where he grew up in Australia uh, when he plays in Melbourne. So I, I like that he gets to start close to home. That means that he doesn't have the pressure. He, you know, he can kind of get back to a familiar state of life and that'll also help him in his play. But I do, uh, finally, you know, he said, he mentioned that, but he, you know, obviously he has dreams of one day being in the NBA and hopefully that this gives him an opportunity to be showcased to NBA teams who may need him down the line. So I think it's a great place for him to start. Uh, he gets to go home. He gets to be comfortable and relaxed and get to play, uh, some competitive basketball. I mean, the NBL is one of the better leagues in the world uh, outside of the NBA. So uh, good on him for this. And, and I'm glad that you were able to ask so many questions because he had some great answers. I think that Donald, your point about him wanting to eventually come back to the NBA may seem far-fetched perhaps even to Duke fans because just because Jack didn't get that much playing time while he was in Durham, but there are other Duke players who, who have done that, who have been able to, to overcome not being major rotation players and still get a taste at the NBA. It, it, it's really just about continued commitment to, to getting better on the court. Jack is obviously a, a very mature player, so he knows what it takes to get better. It's just a matter of if he's, he's able to get there while he's playing in the NBA in the, excuse me, the NBL. Uh, I, I'm, I'm also excited for him about this. I think that, as you said, his comments were, were pretty poignant, um, particularly uh, around all that he's learned about about racial injustice. I think we talked about this a little on the show when we when we started discussing these issues not so long ago. That college sports is one of those places where different types of people come together in ways that are not common throughout our society. There are a lot of 
you know, young, mostly black, um, poor athletes who play basketball and football at a high level in division one. And a lot of the coaches are wealthier and whiter and the administrators are wealthier and whiter. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a great place for, for conversations to start where they otherwise wouldn't. And Jack is a perfect example of that. And as you said, Donald, he comes from a, a different society that has some of the same issues. So uh, I thought that that commentary was great and really spoke to his, uh, his thoughtfulness around all these issues. And Sam, real quickly, you know, you just mentioned it. You, college basketball, college in general, is where people kind of go to A, you know, they get to expand their horizons and learn more about themselves. And they also get to learn about other people in a very, you know, very closed environment. So, you know, when I, you know, went to college, when I went to Duke, I didn't know anyone outside of, you know, mostly my, you know, hometown and mostly my school. You get to meet people from all around the world. You get to meet people of different cultures, different races, different creeds, different sex. And you get to learn from them. And that's part of that building experience. And for college sports is even more so because you guys, I mean, the guys are together all the time. You know, all of us have seen it on the campus. Those guys were together all the time and they learn from each other and they grow with each other. And as he said, his best friend on the team was Javit. And, and that is, you know, learning from him for four years is something that he probably wouldn't have gotten if he stayed in Australia. So I, I like that he, not only, you know, I, I think he took advantage of this opportunity to learn more about himself being so far away from home, but also to learn from others and to really learn enough that he felt comfortable and compelled to step up and defend them. I think that's great. That's what you want to see from our college athletes. Uh, you know, one thing I'll say that that stuck out to me a little bit in the interview was when when Mary Dunleavy of WRAL asked Jack about Coach K, you know, saying that that Jack was, you know, the, the best teammate ever. Um, Jack almost immediately, and I should preface this by saying, I think that everyone tries to be humble um, and and doesn't like to say, oh, yeah, it's all about me. But but the way Jack deflected that question, I thought was very interesting. And he deflected it by talking about Justin Robinson. Um, and he immediately said, you know, I don't know why, essentially said, I don't know why Coach K would say this about me because because I was on a team with J-Rob and J-Rob's the most selfless player I've ever known. And then he and then he also immediately said, you know, it's a bummer that we didn't get to have a true March Madness so the world could have seen what J-Rob had turned himself into. Um, and, and, you know, to take this to a broader sense, to me, that's the saddest part of us losing the end of the season that we just lost a few months ago. I was at that Carolina game, the last game that Duke played, a game that Justin Robinson started in and and was, if not the star, certainly a star of that game. Um, I'm, I'm so bummed that we don't get to see more of what was happening there, what more of what happened with J-Rob over the final half dozen or so games of his career. But I love that Jack White um, almost immediately when you say to him, hey, Coach K has this wonderful compliment for you, he goes, no, 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 J-Rob's the guy who should have been complimented, not me. It shows you what it means to be a teammate. It shows you what it means to be a team, respect each other, and build together with each other. And, and just to take it back to the, big, to the initial point that Donald made about the NBA, we saw Justin Robinson come from being a walk-on to being arguably one of Duke's best players. Um, and it happened very quickly for him although it also happened over the course of a long, long period of time of hard work. Uh, to me, that's inspiring. And it tells me that if Jack White can similarly go from the NBL to the NBA someday, I have no doubt about that. And the inspiration for him to do that is probably what happened with Justin Robinson over his career. It, speaking on Justin Robinson, I know Jack, like you said, he immediately was like, I don't know why Coach K told, brought my name up because Justin Robinson plays on the team. The universal praise that we have seen, and we've talked about it on previous episodes before, the universal praise that everyone has for Justin Robinson and not only, like you said, his trajectory, what he started as at Duke and what he became, and just basically like how he took over and how he was a leader and how he did everything that was asked of him and then more. Like That universal praise is something that I don't think we've seen from a Duke player in a very long time. And I, it, we've talked again, we've said those words before, like the, the, just his play, his trajectory, his story is something that years from now, I want to go back and look at it and just be like, this deserves a deeper dive to see what is in the mind of a Justin Robinson to get him from that point. And to also at the same time, become someone who is so well liked by 
everybody that when people are talking about like, oh, you had a great game, they're like, no, Justin had a great game. And, and they, you could tell throughout the year that whenever Justin had a good game, no one else wanted to talk about themselves. They, they stopped. They're like, yeah, I, you know, I, I helped the team win, but Justin Robinson did A, B, C, D, E, and F. And I really, really liked that about just how everyone's been speaking about it. And, and Jack's, was, Jack's answer was no exception to that. And I'll say it again. I've said this a million times, but I can't resist not saying it again. How tragic that we don't get the final chapter, that we don't get the end of the story, because it would have been, you know, 30 for 30 kind of amazing story that that we just don't, you know, the final commercial break happens and then you come back from commercial and they go, and then there was COVID and we stopped playing basketball. In hockey, you know, when they lift the Stanley Cup, usually the captain lifts the Stanley Cup and then he goes to find someone who means a lot to the team or, you know, has waited a long time to hoist the cup. And there, and it's always a tradition that they, that someone of that magnitude gets to take it first. This would have been one, if we had won it all, coach K would have just taken the trophy and given it straight to J Rob. And no one would have, everyone would have probably lifted them up and carried them off the Amen. field, off the court. It would have been great. And yes, we were denied that as terrible. All right, guys, we're going to move on to something uh, a little more mundane, so to speak. I know the two of you are really excited about this. Donald, you're kind of the guru of the of fashion for us. So I will let you introduce the next topic. It has to do with an announcement that Duke men's basketball made on Twitter this week. Take it away, my fashionable friend. So, yes, it was it was it wasn't even an announcement. It was just an off the off the cuff comment that they had on Twitter on one of their posts. And at the end of this year, you'll go back to, you know, pre-COVID times at the end of this year. We had six Duke jerseys that were released in this past season. And they said that five of those six would be carried into next year. And so everyone was like, okay, well, which one is going to get eliminated? And the answer is the, the one that they wore in Chapel Hill against UNC. Now, everyone has visual, you know, a, it was a, a huge debate over whether you liked or loved those jerseys, but they were meant for one game to honor, the, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the first game between the two schools. So I had no problem with it. Other people did. Fast forward to now. The outcome, take- by the way, of those mm-hmm. jerseys, Donald, we can live with. Yeah, absolutely. You one and know. You win one and know. One of cool. the best Retire games great. we've ever seen. Great. Raise it to the rafters. Retired. But but it was now, ugly. <laughs> <laughs> now it was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> now, moving forward, everyone's like, okay, so what's that new jersey that they're going to introduce? And I believe it was Tuesday on Twitter, they just said, hey, guys, we know you like the Brotherhood jersey, that navy and white, just beautiful, sexy jersey that they had during the year. They're like, we know you like that jersey. What would you guys think of us doing it in white and gray, like a white and navy with like a home version for next year? And the Internet was like, stop teasing me. Stop playing my emotions. Just give us the damn jersey. And let me tell you, if they do that, I swear to you, if they don't put that on sale, Sam, Sam, back me up. If they don't put this on sale. We're burning will, down the Bryan Center. I, I will – like, honestly, I might get arrested for trying to break into camera to steal one. I'm getting one of these jerseys next year, Duke. If you want to hand one to me, that's fine. If you want me to depart with my hard-earned money, you could do so. But these jerseys going to be going to be sitting in my closet by the end of next season. It, just go ahead and release them. You know everybody wants them. Just go ahead and do it and just make it be the best-selling jersey of all time. It's Sam, the what do you got? The most obvious hype thing that they've tweeted all summer i mean like the the praise for those jerseys was near universal everyone thought they were cool and of course we want the white ones like the, the blue ones <laughs> looked cool but it was a little bit jarring to see duke playing in blue jerseys or in not white jerseys at home so of course bring the white ones forget all these other jerseys they're silly it turns out that for years and years we've just been rooting for the wrong jerseys we want the script duke jerseys with the navy blue they're awesome. Everyone knows they're awesome. And and I did see I, one Photoshopper on Twitter made a version that looks exactly like the blue, but they they have the colors inverted. So it's basically what you would expect the the white jerseys to look like. I think they were on Matthew Hurt. And oh my God, it's stunning. I I want them so badly. Just and, just and, do it. Just do they, it. Yeah. Just sell them. I know they're supposed to be exclusive, but they're but just just do it for us or or like like you said, Donald, just send just send copies. Instead of us, us. I'll give you my address. 
we like I said, I'll even pay for it. Like some people are always about to be the influencers. Like, yeah, send me all this stuff, and I'll like you know Instagram for it. I will buy one from you, and I will do the same thing. Hey, make this They're pledge always- to you. <laughs> Look, if you if you signed up for any Duke basketball anything or any Duke athletics anything in your life, you get tons of emails asking you for money and donations and all that kind of stuff. I'll send you money. You send me one of those jerseys. Exactly. That's it. That's all we ask. We're, please, we're, please, please take my money. Please take yeah, my money. Please take my money. All no, no, no. See, <laughs> don't take my money. Take all of it. Like, if you release that jersey in three numbers i will have three numbers hanging in my closet if you release it in four i'll have four if you release the whole team i will have the whole team I'm telling you donald, like i can i'll eight. wear one every day i don't care donald do you have a jersey number a duke jersey number that you prefer like is there a is there a player who whose jersey you really want to have or something like that so that's a great question my favorite number ever is number 2 because i'm donald line the second named after my father. So I always opted for number two. In baseball and softball, my lucky number was seven because when I was, the year that I was a center fielder, I was number seven and just destroyed Little League, like all of it, like was was the man. So seven has always has been my number, but you can't have seven in college basketball because they only do numbers you can do with one hand. So number two is my jersey. So that means that Quinn Cook, Nolan Smith, my boys, because they put out jerseys that had number two. Luol Deng. Luol Deng. Deng. But they didn't sell his jersey uh, when I was in school. Um, and then when he was – they were going to sell the next year, but then he left for the draft. So the first number two jersey I got was that of the people's champ, Nolan Smith. I've got, I've got a, a jersey that, was, that would have been a Nolan Smith jersey when I bought it. So mm-hmm. there you go. That's, that's a good one too. I like that. All right, good answers. Jason, do you have anything to say about, about well, jerseys? I was just going to say – not about jerseys that much other than – I. I would the one you guys are drooling over. I would buy, and I don't buy a lot of jerseys. It, it is a really, a really sharp looking look. Um, but in terms of favorite number, the Seattle Kraken have awesome jerseys. These are cooler. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, in terms of jersey numbers, just really quick back to my childhood. Growing up, I was always number twenty one. If I could be twenty one, I always wanted to be twenty one. Can either of you guess why I wanted to be twenty one? Back in the 21. back when you were a kid, and you grew yeah. up in Atlanta, right? Yeah, you're Dominique, man. Yes, the human highlight film, yeah. Dominique Wilkins. I lived for Dominique Wilkins, number 21. But I will say that as I've become more of an adult, I am very partial to number 33, Grant Hill. I, um, I, Grant, Grant was there right after I was there. And that's been the jersey that I've always gravitated to the most. And uh, most of the jerseys, the Duke jerseys that are hanging in my closet are number 33. I do like the fact that I went to school in an era where a lot of the jerseys uh, had not yet been retired. So I have them. So, you know, my first jersey was number 30, 31 for Shane. Then I got a number 21. Then I got a number 22, like, and then uh, four, like those jerseys were all available. 23, those are all available uh, because those guys have seen those numbers retired since I went to school. So it's, I'm lucky in the fact that a lot of my jerseys that I have deep, deep in a box somewhere, uh, or hanging in my closet are jerseys that no one can really ever buy again because they're retired. I've always been partial to the number 11. I don't know why, but one, it's retired for Duke. It's Bobby Hurley's number. Probably the most important player in Washington Nationals history is Ryan Zimmerman, and he's number 11. So I, I like that one too. So uh, I guess we'll never see another Duke jersey in 11, but maybe if they if they sell these new ones in 11, I could, I could get that. I don't know what their plans are for it. They did uh, a few years ago. This was back in like I want to say 2007 or 2008. They did have a run where they sold at least it at the Duke store. Um, you couldn't get them online, but they sold jerseys that had former great players on the back with their names on the back, and they had their numbers. So you could get an Elton Brand jersey, you could get a Steve Wojciechowski jersey, uh, Grant Hill. But they had their in Hurley. They could ha- they had their names on the back. So. They did that for one year, I think. And if you go down into the very bottom of the basement of the Duke store where they had the clearance racks, you still might be able to find a couple random ones laying around. Guys, we got to take a break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the future of college football and why the gap between the big schools and the small schools may be coming too big for anyone to ever bridge ever again. That story after these messages.
All right, gentlemen, we're about to wrap things up. But before we do, um, I just want to talk very quickly about some stuff that I've been reading lately, um, you know, in these COVID times uh, about the impact of the decisions of the big college football conferences um, on smaller conferences. Uh, just this week, um, the athletic director at New Mexico State, Mario uh, Moshe, said that um, his school had seen uh, already seen a game against UCLA um, canceled. And, and they also have a game against Florida that they think will probably also be canceled. Um, th these, these are buy games. These are games where New Mexico State is being paid to go to a, a big Power Five conference school's um, home and, uh, and, and be a sacrificial lamb. And, and they get paid a lot of money to, to do this. They were going to get paid $1.2 million by UCLA. The, the Pac-12 has already announced that they're not playing any non-conference games. So that $1.2 million is going away. They're due $1.53 million from Florida, $1.5 million from Florida um, that is probably also going to go away because the SEC is probably going to also say, we're not going to play non-conference teams. We're only going to play conference opponents this year. So that's you know coming close to $3 million that New Mexico State was going to get um, from these football games that it's not going to get. And he said that that represents around 25 to 30 percent of their revenues um, of the New Mexico State Athletic Department budget for the year. And you take away 25 plus percent of their budget and New Mexico State is going to have to make some very, very hard decisions. And out of this sort of news, it's not really new news. It's, you know, it's not like he was breaking any. Um, stories by talking about this. A lot of schools are talking about it. A lot of schools, more and more schools are going to the cancellation of non-conference games. Um, I, I was reading some things and people are saying, you know, this is the wave of the future, that as the Power Five teams try to generate more and more income for themselves to make up for what they're losing this year, and because it's always a money battle, it's always a race to make the biggest pile of green cash that you can in the college sports world, as the Big Ten, the SEC, the Pac-12, the ACC, and the Big 12, and so on, as they all race to make more money, they're going to find that they need to play more and more conference games. They need to play fewer and fewer games against small FCS and group of five opponents because the amount of money that the SEC can get for an extra conference game is exponentially more in terms of television revenue than what they can get for playing some, uh, you know, FCS school that they beat by 40 plus points and no one bothers to watch the game. So these games are going to start going away. There are going to be fewer games out there for these smaller schools to play. And as a result, you're going to have to pay them less to get them to come in and play because, you know, there's going to be more demand for please, please, please pay me than there is going to be schools who are willing to pay you. Supply and demand make it really simple. You're not going to see one and a half million dollars being paid by Florida to New Mexico State. It may be that Florida is able to pay someone seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And the fine, the, the ultimate impact of all this, I think, and others are saying, is that we are moving closer and closer toward a world where there are the Power Five schools playing college football, and there won't really be anyone else. There'll be a couple independents like Notre Dame. Uh, you know, is BYU still an independent? I think they are. You know, there'll be a couple other schools that try and hang around in various ways. But for the most part, they're going to be the Power Five, and then everyone else is going to go away to a different level because they cannot afford to continue to compete. Donald, I know you have thoughts on this. You don't think this is what's happening. I think this is what's happening. I think COVID has sped it up, and it's going to come a lot faster than we thought. I have a lot of thoughts on it, so I'm going to start with this. I, I think the problem that we have initially is that college football has set themselves up where if you lose a game, you're out of national title contention for the most part. Well, you know, there's the SEC thing, which is completely separate. But teams in college football and even to a lesser extent, college basketball have complained at having a ton of big games right off the bat that matter because they don't want to lose that game in week one. They think it's, you know, that'll take them out of national title contention in December. College football doesn't have a preseason like the NFL. So teams want to be able to test themselves against what they would consider weaker competition to kind of work out those mistakes that they would have done in a preseason before they get to the conference games that do matter. So New Mexico State and these other schools, they're not losing these guarantee games because the Power 5 t schools don't want to play them. They're losing them because there's a pandemic. And I think it's premature to say that those games are completely going away. The other thing is college football. This, If they're going to do this, this is going to lend to the fact that 
voters and the college football playoff committee, they're going to fall back on those implicit biases regarding which conferences are good and which ones aren't. I mean, sometimes you need these common opponents to help settle these debates, which is why fans clamor for some of these non-conference games. You you want to see, I mean, and it not necessarily just the, the smaller ones, right? We're not talking about the New Mexico states all the time, but you want to see if Ohio State or Michigan can beat Florida. You want to see if Texas and the Big 12 are really that far ahead of UCLA in the Pac-12. We still part, be debating. Donald, it's hmm? part of why those games at the beginning of the season are so important, right? Where right. where teams from different conferences will play each other. And there are some that are rivalry-based, like mm-hmm. the ones between some of the ACC and SEC teams at the end of the year, but there usually aren't that many of those games. So when Alabama decides to play Michigan at the beginning of the season, that becomes the, the tone setter for talking about the Big Ten and talking about the SEC. Right, and here's the thing. We'd still be debating if Central Florida was any good from a couple years ago if they weren't able to play Power 5 schools even within the state of Florida, right? Even locally, we don't want to see, you know, Duke football play just conference. We want to see them go against a Northwestern or even a Baylor, right? You know, that game that went when we went to Baylor and beat them, that was a big game for us. It may not have been they Baylor may not have seen that way, but we did. We like these matchups because it gives us a chance to see new teams, new looks, and test ourselves against opponents that we don't normally see. I was gonna say just to be clear, uh- this this thing that I'm talking about and that people see as coming is not the end of non-conference football. It's that you're not going to see small teams being paid to to get crushed by big teams. You're you're going to see ACC teams playing SEC teams, playing Big Ten ten teams, and so on. In fact, you'll probably see more of that because they won't be able to buy games against these smaller conference teams because those smaller conference teams. All those conferences are going to go away from the Division One level. They're just not going to bother to compete anymore because they can't and because there isn't going to be enough money for them to make it worth their while. That's yeah, the idea. I, th- I think that part is premature. I think no one knows what's happening tomorrow, next week, next month. We can't say that conferences know that this is the way to go and that next year – I mean, for all we know, next year we could either be – deeper into this pandemic or completely out of it and back to normal. We have no idea. And I mean, even if you think about this, right, we don't even know how conference, all these conferences are doing different things when it comes to football. Some conferences are saying, we're just doing, we're going to delay the start a couple of like a month. There's some that are saying we're only going to do conference games and there's some that are not playing at all. So they don't even have a handle on that. That leads me to believe that it's premature for all of them to be on the same page with regards to paying some of these, you know, not or mid-major, we'll call mid-major conferences to play football down the road. Because I think there's going to be a point where they're going to say, we want to play these teams because we don't have the preseason that the NFL does. And we want to be able to work out these mistakes before we play the games that we think matter. There's a longer term issue here that I don't think anyone in the sport of college football or at the NCAA is thinking deeply enough about, which is that the players that go to FCS programs or, or group of five teams, the, the ones that are getting to play in these, in these buy games, those players are playing in high school with the same kids who get to go to division one. You don't, the, the, the kids who play division one football don't get separated from their peers at you know, the beginning of high school, because everyone knows they're going division one, it changes based on how much they grow and and how dedicated they are and all these different other factors. So there's an ecosystem of football that relies not just on players being good enough to play at division one, but also that there are enough players around them to have them be competitive in high school. One of the drivers of there being so many players that play in high school is that there are a lot of scholarships available in college for them to keep playing football, even if they're not at these big time programs. So if you're going to play football at University of Richmond or at Elon, one of these schools that is near Duke, that the Duke has played in the non-conference, they're still getting football scholarships. Maybe they're only partial scholarships, but they're still getting them because those players were able to get some training in high school. They're still going to get to play against some of these same kids in college, although they're more likely to, to be on the losing end of those games. And if, you have that, the NF- and if you have dreams of the NFL, it's not necessarily a glass ceiling to go to a mid-major school. You still can exactly. get the eyeballs that'll get you into the league. And you know that if you play at a, at a North Dakota State or an Appalachian State or, a, or Richmond, these schools produce NFL players. So that even that aside, you need lower tier 
college football teams to exist for there to be enough players to make a competitive power five. Now, how long would it take for the power five to look so much worse that like people are not interested in going to the games a long time. It would take a lot of high schools deciding they don't want to play football anymore. It would, it would take a lot of resources being removed from the high school level and, and, and the college level to do that. Um, But if college football is thinking really long-term and strategically about this, they want these, these lower tier teams to continue to exist so that the money can keep flowing across the entire football ecosystem. It's why major league baseball continues to have a huge minor league system because you don't just need the players who are going to come up and be major league stars to play in the minor leagues. You need players that are not going to make it to exist there for there to be enough room for competition and and growth for those really high potential players. So the only thing I'd say about that is I don't know that you're going to find high schools going away from football because there are fewer scholarships because all those kids first of all they enjoy playing at the high school level but second of all they they all have dreams of playing for a power five school and so they're going to keep on competing keep on trying even though there may not be quite as many scholarships available out there um in the end because there are schools that stop playing division one football that's number one number two is guys there's a simple reality here which is If the SEC is talking to CBS about their contract and CBS says, you're currently playing eight conference games or whatever it is, eight, nine, eight, I think. You're currently playing eight conference games and we're paying each one of your schools $17 million a year to play eight conference games. If you go to 10 conference games, if you give me that many more good conference games over the course of the year, maybe we push the end of the year back by a week or two so I spread them out a little bit more so I get better content every single week. Rather than paying you $15, $17 million a year, I'm going to pay you $22 million a year per team. The SEC is not going to say no. The ACC is not going to say no. So, you, Sam, you may be absolutely right. It may be that in the grand scheme of things for the health of college football, it's better if there are a lot more leagues and there's more players out there and a bigger universe and all that other kind of stuff. But when you dangle an extra two, four, five, eight, maybe $10 million from a TV contract in front of these conferences per team, they're not going to say no. I, you know, I just think this that's going to be the reality. Which, which, which is why I said college football and college sports in general needs more leadership that is focused on the sort of long-term growth and Amen. development of mm-hmm. the, of the programs. It, it's why, it's why Jay Billis likes to talk about, there should be a, a college basketball commissioner and, and that person should be overseeing the sport, not as the representative of the NCAA and not as a, athletic director of one of the schools, but looking big picture at, at, at the whole sport and the whole universe of, of college sports and, and, and the individual sports of basketball and football being the real drivers of revenue for all the other ones. And the yes, last and note on you are, well, you are absolutely correct about that, but I want to point something out. The NCAA doesn't even have very much power, power over power five schools in terms of football at this point. They have essentially, they've essentially said to the NCAA, we are calling our own shots. The notion that you were going to put a, a college football czar or commissioner or whatever in place who would actually be able to tell the conferences, no, 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 you need to make sure that you're doing things to make sure the smaller conferences also survive. Not happening. Uh, again, Sam, what you're saying, I agree, makes sense from a competitive standpoint and from the long, long, long-term health of the sport. But I just don't think any of this is happening. I'm trying to be a realist. Well, That's the, note that you, the note that you had on uh, just the fact that uh, conferences can go a you know go from eight to nine we're already seeing that the big 10 moved from eight conference games to nine in college basketball this past year was the first year that the acc did 20 games instead of 18 what happened people are paying more money for play for teams to come in and get served at home and the problem was some of these teams were actually beating them and that's where we kind of get the, the 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 thing here is do you want to pay more money to see a team possibly beat you we saw that on occasion in college football but as these numbers go up there's they're already talking about it some conferences are already doing it we're just we're not seeing it i think right now this is an unprecedented moment it's not an unprecedented it's not an unprecedented era it's an unprecedented moment we don't know yet if it'll be an era we're done on that okay yeah All right, well, we will leave it there. Maybe we'll come back to this in nine months or a year, hopefully when the world has pulled out of this crazy. We will not not stop talking about college sports realignment. (laughs) I promise. Nope. It's an evergreen topic. 
we, we will see in a while whether uh, Donald is more right or I'm more right. I hope that Donald's right. I would love to be wrong on this because I like the way college sports has been working for a while. And I, I would love to be appointed. I would love to be appointed commissioner of, of college football or college basketball, whatever job the, the schools want to collectively give me. I'm happy to, to run the show here. And I'm you happy know, to I, order pizzas for Sam. I ordered one just a minute ago and it was delicious. So I, I know fantastic. I can do that on a national level. Donald, so you've got path. Donald. You, you, I've got you down for chief of staff Perfect. in my administration. Perfect. Okay. So I like it. In the in this past week, we've determined that Jason needs a boat, Sam needs to become commissioner of college sports, and Donald needs to be his chief of staff. People, can we make this happen? Can we just make this happen, please? I, I don't have huge aspirations, but I do want this. <laughs> uh, that's going to do it for us this week on episode 219 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Folks, send us your questions and comments to dbrpodcast at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Tell us how stupid we were. Tell us how smart we were. Ask us something interesting, and we will talk about it on the podcast. We ask Go you Nats. again. <laughs> Sorry, hey, what? We're not, we're not at that point yet. Hold on. We ask you again, like and subscribe. Rate us. Do all that kind of jazz because it's the summer, and it's been a, kind of a slowdown. Tell your friends about us. We want to have more and more of the DBR podcast for you out there. But for now, we are wrapping things up. I am Jason. Thanks for joining me. For Donald and Sam, thanks for joining them. This is DBR Podcast episode 219. The Duke Band now will play us home. Wear your masks. Release the Kraken. Ha, 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 ha.